name's Josh Naker, and uh, I'm from Bradford County, Kentucky. And I'm going to try my best to teach y'all about plant that. And this is the first time I ever try to teach like a crowd for more than two people. And I ain't had to get in front of a bunch of people like this in about 15 years. So if I get a little squirrely, just look over me. <laughs> So, just the basics of it, and everything I do here, I don't use no copper or no steel, no modern stuff. I mean, a lot of nappers do, and that's okay. I ain't trying to disparage anybody that wants to use copper or steel or anything like that. But my thing is that I try to replicate what I see, what I find, and like Native American stuff. And they sure didn't have no steel or, or copper tools. So really what I try to do is just replicate stuff that I find. And this, like this board here, this is all artifacts that I found. As they've been saying, Todd's been with me on yeah, a couple yeah. of these trips and we found them. And, uh, and you can see this here, it ain't none of them really perfect. And that's what you see in a lot of Native American artifacts. Most of what you see is, is kind of, you'll look at it and you'll think here, so this is what happened to me anyways, and this is what got me curious on this. I just got interested in finding arrowheads the last three years or so. <clears throat> and I'd look at them and I'd pick them up and I'd think, well, well, why did they leave that big hump on there? Or why did they, why is that not symmetrical? Well, now I know that I try to make, make it with the same stuff that they was doing so now I understand why you have asymmetry and stuff or you'll have a knot here that you think they should have broke off but just a curiosity about this stuff that made me want to get into it and just it's just hard for me to fathom that people thousands of years ago could could go out in into, into their environment and find things to make viable weapons or tools <coughs> mean, deadly weapons we ain't just talking about something you're going to cut cut leaves off a stick with. Some of these could have very well took lives, human lives, animal lives. Mm -hmm. They was made to be weapons. You know. this, this was these people's whole lives. And where would you find those? In creek beds? Well, Along river uh, banks? Would you excavate them? Or? Just, just all of the above. Okay. Uh, both of them are in the corner. Them were found in the creek. Um, me and Todd excavated uh, this one, this one. That one almost looks like one from up there and keeps looking. You might have found that somewhere. I think that's a field found. Okay. Uh, me and Todd found this one, this one, and I think there's another in a cave. Uh, I found a lot of them in fields. And just, I guess you'd just all you'd over the place. naturally go to an area that's known to have been an Indian reservation of or camp. And, well, just, well, you wouldn't, so, want, you can, wouldn't have gone in your backyard, I guess what I'm saying. Well, it just depends yeah. on where you live. Where you dug them okay. in his yard. Just, I, they, yeah, I found them in my yard. Okay. Just, just anywhere that you find sign of like a primitive people, just find flint chips, really, because uh -huh. that's the only thing left. There ain't nothing left from hundreds of thousands of years ago. Hide and antler stuff like this that's been around their camp. That's the only thing left is it, just stone like this. Yeah. Well, you, you might you you probably will answer this question in a little while. And if y'all got but, questions, well, I, just, just I, call I, them I, out. I just kind of always wondered, like, you know, if you had a, a, a group of group of Indians, um, you know, maybe is it like one or two guys' jobs to make points for the whole for the group? Well, we, we it, talked about that. Yeah. And, and also, I always, always kind of wondered, you know, when you see a asymmetrical one or one that you might think, I don't know, why did this? Why did this ever? Like, I wonder, like, I just always have kind of wondered, like, is a guy leaning on a tree, man, is he, is he napping away because he see, you know, yeah. how, how fat, 
you know, does that take an hour to make? Or I, mean, I guess you could put as much time into one as you want. Exactly. Yeah, or like a really fast one that that's you need like true. right away, you know? Well, that that's, I'll, I'll hit on your last question there too about, about taking time. One, one thing you see in uh, in native artifacts, and this, this seems backwards and false, but it's true. <clears throat> the earlier primitive people, like paleo people and archaic people thousands of years ago, they made the best stuff because they was, they was big game hunters. That was their primary source of food. And to be a big game hunter, you couldn't be making, you couldn't be making points like this and expect to kill an elk or a, a buffalo or whatever. So the, the, the further you go back in time, the better their craftsmanship was because of how they lived. They had to have better stuff to bring down animals. So, and as time progressed, they started farming and, uh, and corn caught on. Corn would be like 70, 80% of a lot of their diets. So then they started making stuff like this and this. Just stuff that you look at it and think, man, y'all couldn't do no better than that. But I mean, that, that was just their culture. They didn't rely on hunting so much. Of course, they had to defend themselves from other other primitive people and stuff, but they just wouldn't so much set on making making killer points because of their culture. Just like ours has changed. How many people sit around nowadays and, and make arrowheads thinking they're going to have to shoot a big buck with it or something? You know, it just, it just humans change and your culture changes. So that's part. Of, and another thing about like a, maybe seeing like asymmetry in one, like this big one in the center. There's two things, and I'm not, I'm gonna tell y'all too, I'm not an expert at this. I've only been doing this about a year and a half. But the two things I know that will cause like asymmetry or cause a place, like a knob in a place that shouldn't be there or something, is a, is a quality of your stones. And, well, three things, your skill level, of course, and the type of tools you got at your disposal. If, if you've only got a rock, if you've only got a rock like this to nap a point with, you're not going to be able to put no notches in it. You ain't going to really be able to put no serrations in it like this. You're only going to be able to do what every tool you have allows you to do. Just like if you got a screwdriver, you ain't going to be able to drive nails, right? It ain't made for driving nails. It just is the same way with all these tools here. It just looks like a big pile of horn, big pile. These is all white tail anchors too. This ain't nothing fancy off ball. This ain't moose or red stag or anything fancy off the internet. These is all white tail anchors. Oh. Shed that I found. That there was actually from the first buck I ever killed. Kind of sentimental. Uh, stepdad give me a couple, cut them up, and. Uh, but each one has a tool, and I'll go over that too. Or each, each tool has a purpose, a specific purpose. So uh, I guess the first thing I'll go over is material. It's all kind of, and I'm going to try to go, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to hit on, and I'm going to tr just try to hit on all of Go ahead, sir. Well, I have a question. I don't yeah. want to get veer off too far from the arrow here, no, you're but fine. would you know anything about the shaft that they made and, uh, and what type of wood they use and how they straighten that shaft and is it true that they could heat they could heat treat the shaft and the feathering was it a turkey bomb or would you know what i think i think it just depends on the on the time period and the culture and okay. what they was hunting and all that but i know i know for a fact that they use pipe canes you know, what we call cane poles, fishing poles. Yeah, yeah. The hard cane pipes, they use those. Um, a sour wood tree, the, the, the root sprouts off of a sour wood tree naturally grow straight. Okay. If y'all know a sour wood tree, you probably know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The sprouts off of them just naturally grow straight as an arrow. And they say those work real well. And I've not, I've not done any of this. I've read up on it and watched some videos and stuff, but the way they would heat treat them, you, you, you can't use a green arrow all that sap, you know? So even if you have your point on there, it's gonna dry over time and you, your point's gonna get loose. So you do have to heat treat it by far mm -hmm. in ashes, the way I've seen it. Okay. You let your right. fire burn down and you kind of roll it in ashes, bend it over your knee a little straight and like that. Okay. Yeah, they did, they did heat treat them the seasonal. That way when they hit, they didn't have no gill. 
They look okay. straight through. And, uh -huh. and your point wouldn't come like so. Okay, I was curious. I want one more question. On that sinew, man, is sinew, is that some particular part of that deer, or is that the silver skin? It's both, yeah. You both, can, you okay. Can, you, can use, you can use the silver, the silver, what do you, what did you call Silver skin. Like silver, I know the, what you're talking hand, about. Yeah, the there was that coat that covers like the meat. Right, there, right. There's like muscles like there's a sack that holds in there. You can use that, but really, I think the best would have been like a, the big hamstring tendon. Okay. They, they, they would dry that, and once they get it dry, I think they take like a hammer stone like that and pound it out in the strips. That way, instead of having that one big old thick cord, you dry that thing, and you just mill or hit the death with a rock until it's flattened. And then what you've done is created a bunch of little individual strings. Like a thread. Like a thread, Very exactly. Good. Very and, good. Uh, Thank you. They, there's also a feller who's uh, a, a professor shared this with me here a while back, and he's made a lot of primitive stuff like this over the years. If, if any of y'all knows what dog bane is, it's, yeah. a, it's a type of milkweed. Mm -hmm. He said you could take dog bane and break it at the top and and strip it down mm -hmm. and all that I don't know what, cordage that you can get cordage off of that dog bane and he said it's every bit as tough as, as meat okay. and I never knew that I didn't I mean, know it that. cut your fingers if you try to pull on it and break it yeah I know I've dug the roots of it before we've dug roots and sold it but I that never did the dog bane of Indian hemp Indian hemp so that's what we call it yeah. I, I know the I know what it was when he when he said that, but we always call it Indian hemp too. We dig it, sell the roots. Okay, nor is that material. There's good material and bad material. You can't make an arrowhead out of just anything. I mean, you can if you've been doing it for a decade or your whole life or whatever. You probably make one out of these gravels, you know. But uh, like I say, there's good material and it's bad material, and I brought. I brought, brought some examples of both here to show y'all. This is quartz. This comes from around the Rock Castle River. Uh, if y'all been down there, you've probably seen it everywhere. Lake Cumberland's everywhere. And you can make stuff out of quartz, but this really is a bad example. And right there, if you all can see, it's why. It's got little cavities, little pockets in it. That's bad. That's going to cause some problems, right? So, and it's not glassy. It's rough. You'll know a bad material when you rub your hand across it and it feels rough, like a sandstone or something. Or, that's mainly the thing to look for, is glassy material. See that? You look at this is obsidian, just regular black obsidian. And you can just see the difference in that. It's rough and smooth. It's just like a pane of glass. And this stuff here, this, this red stuff is, is obsidian too. It's just a different kind. But this, this is the sharpest material on the planet. Uh, you would think it'd be diamond or steel. I think it's like, I forget to nurse, like, if, if they put this under a microscope and hone it or whatever, this is like 50 times sharper than steel or something. Unreal, unreal. This, this stuff will cut you and you won't even know you cut. Until you look and you believe. It's super, super sharp. Where is that mine? Uh, Rocky Mountains, parts of Mexico. You don't, you don't really see much of it east of the Mississippi. Just I, very isolated pockets you see it. But I know this comes from out west. And it, it's killer material. And you can see why because it's so glass. Wow. Yeah. But that's what you want to look for. Smooth. Anything smooth? It's easy to play. Here's another, another example of obsidian, like a smoky can. And here you can see the rind in it. This is another thing about stone. Every stone will have a rind. And what the rind is, is where, where this, where your good material meets bad material, like a sedimentary rock. See, it looks like a honeycomb or something. Mm -hmm. And that's rough. If you try to hit that with something, it's just going to disintegrate and blow out everywhere. And that will cause you problems anytime you have a rind, a rough rind like that. Another rough example, this is a breath at church where me and Todd live and it's actually not because it's from breath at county where we live it's because it's from the breath at formation in the rock strata so this is breath at church rough stuff hard to work with it's sharp as it can be but it's got a funny matrix 
it's it's like it you can see there it's almost like it's got little squares and it. it's not straight at all it's really hard to work and here's an example of what can happen when you're using bad material and you hit stuff too hard because you ain't got no business fooling with it to start with Right there, I tried to take too much off in that bite. Just hammer and hammer and hammer and getting madder, getting madder. Broke it. That's Fort Payne shirt. That's from around Lake Cumberland. But it's a good example of why you want to use good material. You don't want to fight with it if you can help it. Also, glass is one I didn't want to leave out. Glass. I really like doing stuff with glass. You see some of them made here. Hmm. The glass. Huh. Hmm real challenging but you can make killer stuff with it because you already your 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 plane's already so thin that anything you make is going to be killer and thin but you just got to fight with that thing the whole way and keep that right you know you over pressure it any bit either with percussion or pressure either one and you just want to shear that thing like a steel bolt or something especially when you get up into this lip right here is you got to go through that lip and then back down <clears throat> to where your plane's flat on both sides. Ideally, that's what you want. And like this is old, this is antique mason glass, so you have a big flat plane. Whereas nowadays, you'll have a concave side and a convex side, and it don't leave much meat. I mean, you know, the bottom of that's that big, but you really aren't going to have this much of it this flat the time you nap that into the center there. I mean you can nap nap it from out to the, the margins of that but your point's not going to be straight. Do you uh, work that from both sides or just one yeah, side? And the way you start that, I can show you all here later, the way, the way you have to do that is you got to you start going all the way around that thing. Okay. All the way around. Just keep working it down. Slop it off. Thinning it and trimming it down. The, work, the most dangerous part about glass, not dangerous, dang, but about breaking your, your, your point is this part. Mm -hmm. You have to get through this first. And a lot of times what will happen is you'll be pecking on this to get down here where you want to make your point. And you'll start a crack. And if you can't get that crack to stop and break right there, it will, go, it will just keep going and get sure it. That's more or less you can chase it then. Yeah. yeah. Once it starts. Yeah. But uh, but it's a lot of fun. It's challenging, but that's another, that's another thing about this stuff. Uh, it's challenging, and you're going to break stuff. If any of y'all decide to get into it, you're going to break stuff. Man, I've broke a truck bed full of stuff, and I ain't been doing it a year and a half. I mean, some of this stuff looks killer, but I don't make killer stuff every time I sit down and make something. Like, you, you got to crawl before you can walk. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, is this all is stuff, stuff you made? Yeah. I was actually going to donate. I think y'all do like a raffle or something. Or, or give away when I do that. I just, I'll donate this in here for, for a giveaway there. But yeah, this is all stuff I made. All these are glass. Glass, glass. That's a glass dagger I made there. But a uh, challenge. Half the time what will with glass is I'll break it in half and then I'll have to make it. <laughs> Alright, moving right along here. Tools. Uh, there's all kinds of different tools in flint mapping. I'm only going to go over uh, aboriginal tools, primitive tools, because that's all I use. So, basically all you got is, uh, all you got to be out in the natural world is rocks and some kind of antler or horn. That's the stuff you're going to come across out in nature. Hammerstone, big hammerstone, small hammerstone. And the bigger the hammer, the bigger flakes you take with it. The smaller, the smaller flakes. And this in here, I really like this in here. I found this in at Lake Cumberland, too. And this might have actually been a hammerstone for Indians. I found it around the Indian camp. But flat on one side, kind of convex over here so if you have to do any secondary percussion where you're using it like a hammer in your hand and a punch to fit your hand but that's about my favorite little rock there for 
and you got all these antlers, punches, and billets. The big one like this, that's what you call a billet. Any anything that you're using to hit this flint with, this not a rock, is a billet. A billet can be wood, it can be a piece of pipe, it can be a piece of a real seasoned hardwood. Anything you're doing this with is a billet. You're actually striking it, not striking chipping it. And that it. would be your uh, a billet's use. This this is called direct percussion. Percussion, just like anything else, when you're hitting something. You know, that's direct percussion. Indirect. It's the only difference. I'm not great at indirect. I can do a little bit if I get a rough spot and have to get it up there and punch it off. But I've seen guys take big rods this long and put them up under the line. I can't do it. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, everybody's got their own skills. You skin can't do it yet. Yeah. That's a positive way to look at it, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, billet. Here's another type of billet. Let's see if I can put one together that I've cut and show y'all how to saw them up. So this was the actual antler before I saw it, and this is the best way I cut. Everybody breaks them down different, right? Everybody does their own thing. This this is how I cut them up. I cut the tines off here as close to the the main beam as I can. That way, you make a small one if it's still one there. But you cut your tines off, and then you got punches, punches, and pressure plates. So there's two punches that come off that main beam, and then you cut him in half right there, right in the curve. Okay, and then what that creates is you can you can use both ends of this billet, and you can use your main beam as a billet this way, and use it as a punch and a pressure flaker this way. So you you're cutting it that way, you got two tools here instead of just one that serves one purpose. And that's basically, that's basically all you're doing with these antlers is just taking and tearing off flakes or taking and punching them off. Like, ideally, when you're doing percussion, you want to make big flakes like this. These are all flakes that I made uh, in the process of thinning this down. This, this started as something like this size. So what you do... Ideally, what you want to do is thin this down and try to make something from this, make something, but in the process, you want to drive big flakes out. And the reason you want to drive big flakes is because then you can make stuff out of all these flakes. If you're just if you're just crushing the edge all the time and just kind of whittling, 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 you're really not, you're just making debris. You're not making anything you can go back and use later. Like you can make a you can make about anything out of that. Make an axe, a knife, a dagger, whatever you want. And then all your all your damage, all your all your chips, you go back and make I'm telling how many arrow points, spear points, just depending on the size of it. But ideally you want to make the best of the material you got. And it's took me a long time to learn how to do that. Man, I've it, do it from the a, edge? Huh? Do it from the edge? Yeah, you, you start in at the edge. You thin it, and that's another, and I'm not great at that. Like right here, mm -hmm. you don't have a thick place like that. Man, them give me fits. That's usually what causes me to break stuff. It's thick places like this. But I'll show you. Here's, here's a blade I've been working on, and this is not finished. I'm going to say I'll probably work, I'll probably work five hours on just getting it down from that. But I've not broke it. So in my mind, I'm doing good. And <laughs> yeah, five hours. I, I thought yeah. it took me five months to do this. <laughs> but there's there's one that I've got down on a big spot. What we'll try to do is thin that down to, to make a, a blade or something like that that I can put in a an anchor. That's an example of what you want to try to get it thinned down to. And this is, or something like this, that's, that's, what a lot of primitive people would thin their stone down to, and they call that a trade blank. And that's what they trade up and down the river, like you were saying. That's what they take along with them instead of taking their stuff. Because maybe people 200 miles from there didn't want their arrowheads, but they could take their stone and nap their stuff with it. So, and you'd call this a preform, too. 
it's not a great free form and I, I left it a little thick in places. But what you can do with this, and the reason they call it a free form, it's already kind of thinned and it's already kind of in a shape of something. So it is a free form of say a spear or an arrow point or whatever, a, a, a knife blade, whatever you want to make. So to make just like this, to make something like this, you got to get to this, like to this stage first. So, so it's a whole process. So you start like this, and then you kind of get it down. You start rounding it and thinning it, and then once you get a shape to it, you can kind of, you can kind of refine it a little more. And that's what you're doing all the time is refining, refining your product all the time. And if you're like me, my problem is knowing when to stop. I got a little bit of OCD, so I will, if I see something that's off like a millimeter, I'll just keep driving at it, and then I'll snap it. And then I'll sit around and pout at myself why I didn't quit and just leave it alone. But that's a personal thing I got. So, let's see. Also, I was going to show you all this. It's hard, I know it's hard for y'all to see little, little bitty stuff up here. Right. This is a point, really hard to see, I know. This is a point that I made from this old rough stuff. And the reason I wanted to show you all this, when I got into flint knapping, this, this is really my goal, was to be able to go out in the world and find a rock and use tools that I found or harvested from animals to make a point. And this is what I, this is proof of. Like this is my goal. And this took me a while, but I got there. And it, it ain't great, it ain't pretty, but it's sharp, and it would work. And if I had to use it, I could, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it took me a long time to where I could get to do this. I found this stone. This was a big rock I brought out of the creek, and I broke it down, and I fooled with it for four months. And yesterday, I finally sat down and made a point out of it. Cause, and not, not just that this took me that long to get started. I failed that many times trying to make something from this. I, I finally got it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Pretty proud of that. But the thing about that is, when, when, when you sit out, when you make yourself a goal like that and you sit out and achieve it, it really gives you confidence in your abilities. And I'm not saying I'm great. I, I don't make any of this stuff to sell it or nothing like that. But it just makes you feel like that if you had to do something like this, you could. And just, just having that feel. And not only that, I enjoy doing this. So that drives you to want to do more and just, and just keep your skill going. Or it does me at least keeps me interested in it. So it's, if one were to take this up and, and attempt to uh, develop your skill, just start using anything you can get your hands on just to just start breaking stuff. Just start breaking stuff. Start breaking stuff. Yeah, what I've done. Well, I'm, I'm best way to learn. The game thing, I, <laughs> I break a lot of stuff. It's the best way to learn. <laughs> I mean, I, I can sit up here and do this in front of y'all all day. But there ain't none of y'all will learn as much as if you sit down and done it for 30 minutes on your own. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I mean, that, I know that because that's how it is for me, and I'm sure it is for everybody else. Mm -hmm. They're, they're just... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is another. This is a... Uh, these beavers. Beavers. Beavers, beavers that uh, Mr. Whitmore here trapped up on our creek, uh, middle quicksand. And tanned. And tanned. Very, very well. This was actually one whole beaver. That he trapped under my, it was a problem. Oh, that is the one I caught down. <laughs> yeah, the right, right there is where I pegged him between the eyes with a 20 yeah. So, uh, this is a beaver that come from my house. I split him with a razor blade, made me a lap pad. These beavers are tough, man. And I know again, y'all can't see right there where my finger is. There's probably about a number seven bird shot right there in this beaver. It's plumb full where somebody laid the lead to him, probably coming up from their garden or their corn. Right a lot of lead in the but they're tough. Yeah, they, they, they make a good lap pad. Especially you get in the center of them like that. And you don't have to have two, but I'm going to use two. I'm going to use this smaller one. Just because that way I can keep the flakes out of my way without flopping this big one everywhere. And it insulates me from beating my leg to death. Oh. 